We are back again with our weekly market review where we analyze the stock market to see if a crash or correction is coming. You know a fallible, we are always focused on managing our risk and watching that downside. Because if you're trying to build long-term wealth in the stock market, that's the way to do it. So first we're gonna go over the general stock market and also talk about inflation, which is a hot topic we're pretty much covering every week now. Then of course we got a few new stocks for you guys to add to your watch list. And finally we got an important lesson about the market from Machiavelli. And as always, we'll be using our research from MacroOps, our global macro research consulting firm. So earnings season is getting started up again and Bloomberg says that there's been a high bar set. So based on existing analyst forecasts for earnings in all of 2021, the S&P 500 trades at almost 24 times estimates among its highest valuation ever. To bring the multiple down to its long-term average of 16 times annual profits, companies in the gauge will have to make about 15% more than the equity research currently expect them to earn in 2023. So what's that all mean? Well, first off, valuations are very high right now. So at 24 times estimates, which you could think of, of like a PE ratio. What's the price versus the earnings? Right now it's at 24. And the long-term average is 16, meaning that, hey, it's really overvalued. Well, to get back to that 16, companies would have to earn a lot more. Because think about a PE ratio. It's price over earnings, right? So the way to make that number smaller is you could either decrease the numerator, which is the price, or increase the denominator, which is the earnings. So if we assume that price is not going anywhere and it's going to stay high, then to bring that down from 24 to 16, you better see earnings really pop. But they're saying that earnings would have to be 15% more than the earnings they're expecting in 2023. Basically, it's not really achievable for these companies to actually hit those numbers in order to bring valuations down, to actually live up to what they're being priced at. And you can see right here in this chart that says price for perfection, meaning all these companies are getting priced for the best possible scenario. Now, there's a few things that you need to know about valuations. First off, they could become way more crazy than they are now. So it doesn't make sense to look at total market valuations or even the valuations of each individual stock and say, hey, they're too rich for me. I'm going to sell everything. That never made sense to me. Because yeah, right now the market is at 24 times estimates, right? What's to stop it from going to 30, 35? In the short term, anything could really happen. What's the saying? That markets can stay irrational longer than you could stay solvent. So never go just based off earnings. But if these things are all priced to perfection, then you know from a macro perspective, things can be a little more wobbly in the stock market, not as secure. If we're saying that everything needs to be perfect for prices to stay where they are, well, that's not very good, right? We know it's pretty fragile. And this goes back to another concept about markets, which is expectations. Expectations drives everything. So if we say that stocks are priced to perfection right now, that means that everyone's expectation is that, again, they're going to hit the best case scenario. But what's the more likely outcome? That they don't live up to those expectations, right? And stocks get hit hard when there's analysts expecting this much in profit and the company only makes this much. That's when you see a big correction in the stock price. When you see stock prices jump up, that's when analysts only expect to say 10 cents in earnings and the company produced 15 cents, then in that reevaluation, that's when people start buying the stock up. So if everything's priced to perfection and the companies need to meet these high standards, most likely outcome, they're not going to meet it and the stock is going to fall once those earnings reports come out. So again, high valuations can always get higher, but they are a signal that you should keep an eye on what's going on because it's getting a little shaky. You got to make sure that these companies in their earnings are still meeting investors' expectations. And the only time you're going to know that is after their earnings come out or after a key fundamental piece of news comes out, then you're going to see the stock price react and you're going to see, are investors disappointed or are they happy? Ned Davis Research lays out the downside of when too much upside is priced in like it is now. So earnings growth right now turned positive and it's accelerating towards its fastest pace since 2010. But the problem is that by the time these earnings rebounds are reported, much of the good news is already priced in. So if we look at historical S&P 500 gains, they've usually been stronger when the earnings growth has been lower and they've been weaker when it's been higher. So once the strong earnings growth was reported in 2021, what will the market have to look forward to in 2022. So what Ned Davis Research is saying here is if everything is looking so good now, once again, when we look at expectations, can we go any higher from here? Can we expect anything better than the strong rebound that we're already having? Another thing to remember here is that the stock market is a forward-looking machine. It's pricing in the future, not what's happening right now. So that's why they're saying by the time these earnings are reported, most of the good news is already priced in. And once again, if everything's priced to perfection and prices are super high with the valuations, the most likely outcome is that the next piece of data disappoints. That's when you see the big correction. So that's really what we're watching for when we say we're looking at the downside. Financials and tech have been two of the strongest sectors year to date, and they're falling right behind energy. So energy has done really well this year because there were extreme bearish expectations, you know, with everything closed, no one driving. But those expectations change, so now they're just mildly bearish, which is another interesting thing about expectations in the stock market. People don't have to be super positive on a company for the stock price to go up. They just have to be less negative than they previously 
work, which is exactly what's happening in the energy space. When expectations are revised, you're gonna see stock prices get revised too. That's how it works. Now, financials and tech in particular have been boosted by buybacks. And we're talking corporate buybacks here. You can see them spiking higher. Last few months, they're finally coming back after a whole year where they were kind of turned off. You can see this green line right here, how low it got. Now it's rebounding. And buybacks have been a huge driver of this super long bull market that we've been in. So it's something we track to see if stock prices still have some juice left in. So the fact that these buybacks are reviving is very bullish. And this whole idea of tracking buybacks kind of goes back to an idea from Ray Dalio. It's something he calls a transactions approach. And what he does when it comes to markets and the economy is he breaks everything down to supply and demand, just goes back to basics. And on the supply side, you can see here he breaks all the big buyers into separate groups. You got domestic households, federal government, central banks. You could put corporations in this fourth little bubble right here. And that's when you start analyzing the incentives. Why would these corporations buy back stock? Well, their executives want their options to shoot up, right? They want to get paid. So any extra money? Yeah, they're going to buy back stock. So that is going to affect the total equation of what's happening in the stock market. So if you could identify these big buyers, understand their incentives, then you can understand what they're going to do in different market situations. And these corporate buybacks, they're just one of the key players in that equation. Now, looking at inflation, China's PPI is accelerating, which tends to lead to positive inflationary surprises globally because they're such a mammoth. So this is something to watch here as we keep tracking inflation. And speaking of inflation, the Economic Policy Institute published a report last week exploring the relationship between labor bargaining power and sticky inflation. So they said the share of workers covered by a collective bargaining agreement fell from 27% in 1979 to just 11.6% in 2019. So this lowered the median hourly wage by $1.56 over the 79 to 2017 period. So in 2017, the median hourly wage was $19.70, but it could have been $21.27 had collective bargaining power not declined at all. And this is interesting because you saw the news that just happened a few days ago. Amazon somehow convinced their workers in Alabama not to unionize, which is very strange when you hear the stories coming out of those factories when they're peeing in bottles and whatnot, and make sure they're protected and getting good wages and getting bathroom breaks even. I actually made a video about that on my new channel, which finally launched, just launched last week. It's called AK News. I'm still trying to figure out what exactly I want to do with that channel, but right now it's looking like one minute skits, which I know you guys used to love those skits. So Monday through Friday, daily one minute news skits. But I'll give you guys more information about that in the coming weeks. Back to markets, the buy climax scenario that we've been talking about the last few weeks, it's pretty much playing out. Now, how long it's going to last? No one really knows. It's kind of like valuation. It could keep going higher and higher. And buy climaxes always last longer than most expect. But sentiment right now is getting to a point where it can't rise much further. And if sentiment sounds like expectations, like we just talked about forever just now, yeah, they are kind of related. And you know how we look at sentiment, right? If people are too bullish, it's actually bad for the stock market because they're all fully invested. So who's left to put their money into the market? You always need that buying pressure to push things up, right? Where on the other side of the coin, if people are bearish, that's actually bullish for the stock market because that means they're still scared and still waiting waiting to put their money in, meaning we got some more fuel for the fire. You can see right here that the AAII net is at its highest level since the January 2018 blow off top. See that hitting huge highs. So this is a bull bear sentiment reading. You can look at TD Ameritrade's IMX index, which basically tracks how retail investors are investing. You see it spiking like crazy, again to the highest level since that last blow off top. So investors actually bought equities in record amounts in the first quarter of 2021. Generous stimulus and bets on economic recovery drove 372 billion into global stock funds. The first three months of the year saw the largest global equity inflows as a share of assets under management since 2006. So tons of money coming to the market because people are super bullish. You can see the last time it was this high was 2006, which is crazy. Long time ago. Wealthy Bank of America clients boosted their equity allocations to 63.6%, the highest level on record. You see that in this chart right here. So all signs suggest this buy climax will be followed by an extended and likely painful consolidation following this blow off top. So we talked about this the last few weeks, but we know that the buy climax, it's going to be pretty good for our portfolios, right? Everything's going to shoot up real nicely, but then we're going to go into that sideways choppy market for a long period of time, which is going to crush a lot of people. So in both scenarios, risk management just becomes so important because with the buy climax, you never know how long it's going to last. And when it turns around, it turns around quick. So good risk management means taking profits on the way up, which is exactly what we do, you know, in our fallible system. So take profits on the way up and then cut your losses on the way down too. But when you're taking those profits on the way up, then your risk is already reduced as the market turns around. And then you cut your losses and you got a lot of gains while everyone else holds the bag and loses everything. And then the same thing happens in this sideways choppy period that we're going to experience. You want to be taking profits and cutting those losses once again.
percent have that risk management in place so you don't get tossed around it's going to be a tough market after this buy climax the people without a strategy or system they're going to get hurt precious metals are going to be some big outperformers in this second half of the year so in the macros portfolio we've been building positions in miners and related plays one of those is exk which we actually talked about back in december if you've been watching these videos they're one of our favorite silver miners and so far they're up 37 percent since we talked about it but it still has a long way to go you can see on the daily chart right here it broke out real nicely and on the longer monthly chart this is just a huge breakout now i wanted to go over this awesome quote from niccolo machiavelli he said whoever wishes to foresee the future must consult the past for human events ever resemble those of preceding times this arises from the fact that they are produced by men who have been and ever will be animated by the same passions so it's very easy to apply that to the market because what do we know about markets they don't change we get the same booms and busts that we've always gotten and that's because human nature doesn't change sure humans might get smarter but we're all still driven by the same emotions that we always have been and those emotions are exactly what play out in the stock market when we look at price charts that's all it's depicting what stupid stuff are humans doing today and that's important to understand that the first principles of markets never change so when you're building a system or a strategy you want something that cues off of those first principles so you guys already know the mechanics of how our fallible system works we got this tsi scanner right here that scans all the nasdaq stocks and ranks them by their momentum we got this nice little number that spits out and then we basically rotate into the top five highest momentum stocks every month so what we basically have here is a momentum system and if we zoom back a little bit we know that momentum is pretty much a universal force it's always worked in the stock market and even beyond the stock market it's worked in life why do sports teams go on streaks why in your personal life when things are going good they get really good and when things are going bad they get pretty bad streaks of momentum they happen in everything and in the stock market in particular we know if it's driven by emotions we're always going to get these bubbles and busts and when the bubble is forming what is that that's momentum that's one person getting into a stock another person seeing that and be like oh i want that money too they jump in and you get a self-fulfilling prophecy of stocks going higher and higher because people think they should that's how momentum forms that's what we benefit off of. and i bring this up just to explain that in your strategy or system you need a robust concept like that something that works with the first principles of the stock market and even more than just the stock market it's the first principles of humans because that's all the stock market is right that's all an economy is really too and if you invest with those principles and with how the market works you're going to do a lot better than if you're investing against the market you got to go with the flow and as always if you want to learn the details of how we do it with our fallible strategy we got this free training right here that explains it step by step i'll put a link to it in this video and down below in the description and comments it's the same strategy i use and all our fallible members use we all love it honestly the only thing that motivates me at this point to keep this youtube channel going are the emails and comments that i get about this system and people saying i'm so glad i found you on youtube because you really changed my life so those emails really keep me going because whether we like it or not protecting our money is an extremely important part of life because if you don't have money you can get into a lot of trouble but anyway the longer i do this stuff the more serious i realize it is and the more i see how much it really helps people and that's why i keep doing it but anyway if you want to see that strategy just click this link right here again it's going to show you exactly how we do it and how all our members have had success with it click this link and i will see you in that free training